Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Friday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm concluding my third week of teaching on living in the balance of grace and faith. This is a five-part series, and we're now on the fourth teaching in this five-part series, and this teaching is about entering the rest. And I started this yesterday out of Hebrews chapter 4, where the writer of Hebrews was comparing our relationship with the Lord in the new birth to the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. They got saved, they came out of bondage, but they never did enter into the things that God really had planned for them because of their unbelief. And so he starts Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2, by saying that we need to also fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of us would miss it because the word that is preached unto us was also preached unto them, but it didn't profit them because it wasn't mixed with faith. And so we've got to believe and act on the word of God or you could fall short of what God has provided for you. And then in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3, he starts talking about that there is a rest for the people of God. And I spent quite a bit of time explaining that one of the reasons people don't seem to get this truth is because they think of rest as laying down and doing nothing. This is not the rest that it's talking about, but it's just talking about like a artist rest after he's been painting because it's complete, it's perfect. You add anything to it, you ruin it. And this is the rest that it's talking about. And then it cites Genesis chapter 2 where it says that the Lord rested on the Sabbath day. And that's not because he was tired. It's not because after one solid week of creation, he just couldn't create one more uh, tree or he's going to, uh, you know, just wear him out. No, he rested because it was complete. And I went back into Genesis 1 and showed that God created man at the very end of creation, even though we were his crowning jewel, the focus of creation. He created us last because if he would have created us first, we wouldn't have had any uh, earth to stand on for a couple of days. We'd have had to tread water. We would have had to dodge trees as they were being created. Food wouldn't have been there for us. He waited and created everything that we would ever need and then he created man, and immediately after the creation of man, that was his last act, and then it says he rested and, and hallowed that Sabbath day. And so when he rested, it, man immediately entered into this completion to where God had already provided everything for them. Also on yesterday's program, I was showing that he not only provided enough just for Adam and Eve, but the Lord anticipated all of the needs of the human race for all time. We now have over 6 billion people on the planet, and did you know that God has never had to create any new oxygen? He's not had to create any new trees, any new fruit, any new food sources. He's not had to create more fish in the sea. God anticipated the needs of the human race for all time, and when he created the heavens and the earth, he did it so completely that he has never had to create any more animals, any more trees, any more air. He doesn't create anything. When he rested, he rested. It's over. It's complete. It's a done deal. The Lord has never created any more of anything. This is why some species have gone extinct. Because for whatever reason, they died out and the Lord didn't create any new ones to replace them. He created the original animals, the original people, the original plants and trees and everything. He created them and God has not created anything to do with this physical creation since. Now that is significant. Because I was just getting to this point at the end of yesterday's program. If the Lord would have created the heavens and the earth, and then created Adam and Eve, and then he rested on the seventh day. What would have happened if Adam and Eve would have come on the eighth day and says, God, what do I eat? And he would have thought, well, I didn't think about that. Now I've got to create something. I've got to respond to your need and, and make something to help meet this need. No, God knew what their need was, and before there were even people in existence, God created food for them to eat. 
Before there were people to breathe the air, God created air for us to breathe. Before we ever had any needs of being hot or cold, God created the perfect climate. He put the earth the exact distance away from the sun. If we were closer, we'd burn up. If we were further away, we'd freeze. God anticipated everything. You know, for me, that's easy to see in creation. But the same thing is true in our new creation. When you got born again, this is the only other act of creation that God has done since he created the heavens and the earth. The only new thing that he done, has done is the new birth, the new creation. When Jesus came to this earth and died, when a person believes on Jesus and puts their faith in him, according to 2 Corinthians 5, 17, you become a new creature. Old things have passed away, all things have become new. And if you'll remember, just a few months ago, I taught on spirit, soul, and body, which is the revelation that God used to just really open up my heart and mind to understand. And in your spirit, when you got born again, it's just like this original physical creation. God anticipated every need that you would ever have. If you get sick, if the doctor tells you you've got cancer, this doesn't catch God by surprise. The Lord doesn't have to do something to heal you of cancer. He already anticipated every sickness, every disease, everything that would ever come against you or the human race. And Jesus had every bit of sickness and disease, infirmity, malady, uh, deformity, chromosome problems, Anything that has ever hit the human race, all of this entered into the physical body of Jesus. And he bore those things and he paid for it. He rose from the dead and placed this raising from the dead power on the inside of every one of us. So that if the doctor comes and tells you, you've only got a month to live, this isn't something new. This isn't something that you've got to go to the Lord with and say, oh God, please heal me. Father, I'm asking you to move in my life. I understand that people do that. But you know what? That's really incorrect. The truth is, God, when you got born again, placed on the inside of you, raising from the dead power. Last week I was teaching on this. Out of um, Ephesians chapter 1, he prayed that our eyes would be open, that we might see the exceeding greatness of his power that we have. The same power that he used when he raised Christ from the dead. You already have that raising from the dead power on the inside of you. It's not out there. You don't have to ask God for more power. You don't have to ask God for healing. You don't have to ask God for salvation. He's already provided all of these things and you have to believe for salvation and reach out and take this free gift of salvation. Likewise, you reach out and take healing. You reach out and you take your prosperity. You reach out and take your joy and your peace. You know, I have people come to me all the time and they'll say something like, man, I've just been through a hard time and I don't feel the love of God. Would you please pray that God would pour his love out in my life? And most people think that that's a very valid request. I tell you, that just, that makes me mad. It gets under my skin. Because you know what you're saying? You're saying that because you don't feel something, then that is the absolute truth and even though the Bible says that he'll never leave you nor forsake you, that he commended his love towards you, that his love is consistent, all these kind of things, you don't feel it. And so it's God's fault. And so you need to petition God and ask God to do something. I tell you, that's wrong. God has never shut off his love towards you, his joy, his peace towards you, his healing towards you, his prosperity towards you. God is faithful to the max. He has never changed. If you aren't healed, if you aren't happy, if you aren't healthy and prosperous and joyful, all of these kind of things, it's because somehow or another you cut your set off, not because God quit transmitting. And so instead of when people come to me and say, would you please pray that God would just pour his love out of my life? I'll say, no, I won't do that. He's already done it. Now, if you want me to pray that you'll begin to receive and that you can get your mind off of all of these things that have occupied you and got you discouraged. And if you want to get your heart and attention back on the Lord, well, then I can pray with you about that to help change you. But I'm not going to impugn God's character and say that God's the one that quit loving you because you don't feel it. See, that's wrong. God has already done his part. And it never fluctuates. It never fluctuates. Man, that's powerful. 
You know, I can see this in creation. Again, I made reference to this briefly. I don't want to get off because I know that there's people watching this program that are tree huggers, that you believe that the earth is fragile. You bought into the global warming stuff, which, you know, I just read an article this week that NASA has done 11 years worth of study by satellites taking the temperature of the earth. And did you know that this global warming stuff is a crock? NASA has confirmed that it hasn't happened. There are fluctuations. It goes up and down, but it, it uh, regulates itself, and it's just a crock. And yet there are people that have bought into it, believe that we are depleting all of the Earth's resources. And, you know, I actually saw something that they have created a car that runs off of water. You just put regular water in it, and it has an ability to separate the hydrogen and burn it. And I can guarantee you two-thirds of the Earth's surface is covered with water. There are resources here. We may need to change the way we do things, but this is not a fragile planet. And uh, there are just people that have bought into all of this stuff because they don't understand it. But if you understand it properly, you know, it doesn't matter if there's 10 billion people on this planet. All of the steel, all of the metal, all of the gold, all of the resources, anything that we need, it's all here. Matter of fact, they've been talking about that, you know, we're running out of oil, and yet they now have these new techniques to drill deeper and actually drill sideways, and they say that there are some, I don't, I'd be wrong if I told you exactly, but multiple times, hundreds of times, as much oil in the earth as they ever realize. Natural gas is a huge resource. The United States would never need to import any energy if we just used what we got. They say it's well over a hundred years worth of all of the energy needs that we could ever need. And then, of course, there's going to be new types of energy and stuff. The point I'm making is there's a lot of people that just don't see this, but once you understand it, this earth, God has given us everything that it takes to sustain billions and billions of people, and he didn't just do it in the 21st century. He did it when he created the heavens and the earth. He anticipated all of this. I can see this, see, in creation, and it just is amazing to me that we don't ever have to worry about where's our next breath coming from. God's anticipated all that. He's got a way of purifying all of the air. It recycles. Everything works. I mean, the, it's just amazing the way that God created creation, and I can see this. Well, likewise, in the new creation, God has given you everything that you will ever need, and this whole concept that we've got to somehow or another petition God and beseech him, and, oh, God, please bless this, and, oh, God, please do this. And you beg, and you plead, and then if something doesn't happen, you take it personally, like, well, here's Almighty God, and if he wanted to, he could have fixed this situation. But God let this person die. God let this marriage fail. God let this business go bankrupt. And so it's God's fault. No, God created everything, but we have a part to play. You have to learn to enter into this place to where you just rest in the things of God and cause it to come to pass. Again, I, I use this example of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve had everything created. They had all of the air that they needed created. They had all of the food that they needed. It was already created before they needed it. But did you know what? God didn't breathe for them. They had to take a breath. If they would have just somehow or another held their breath, I guess they could have passed out. And if they, you know, held it long enough, they could die. But, the, but what they needed, the air that they needed to breathe was there. But they had to cooperate. God didn't just intravenously put all of the food into their system. They had to reach out and partake of it. But is that work? Man, it's not work to just go up to an apple and grab it and say thank you and eat it. God had already provided. He made it grow. He provided all of these things. But they had to reach out and take what God had provided. Likewise, in the Christian life, when you get born again, God places on the inside of you everything that you will ever need. You know, one of the greatest examples of this to me is Galatians 5, 22 and 23, where it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, 
long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Against such there is no law. This is saying what you already have in your born-again spirit. You already have love, joy, peace, all of these things. And yet again, how many people have come and said, Oh, would you pl please pray that the Lord would just give me love? The Bible says you've already got it. Oh, but I don't feel it. Well, then you need to get into faith and you need to start going by what God's Word says instead of what your mate said to you or somebody else who criticized you or whatever you've heard on the news. And you need to start putting your nose in the Word and letting faith come so that you can see things that you have in the spirit realm. But the truth is you already have it. I can't tell you how this has changed my life. There was a time that I used to seek the joy of the Lord and pray for God to pour His blessing and joy and peace out in my life. And then I realized that I already had it, that it was a fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, and peace. My spirit is always rejoicing. I don't care what my flesh is doing. If I'm in fear... If I'm discouraged, if I'm depressed, if somebody said something hurt my feelings, whatever's going on, my spirit, man, is love and joy and peace. That never fluctuates. And anyway, because I know that now, when I begin to feel discouragement or anything contrary to what the Word says, I realize that the problem is, see, I'm not in the spirit. I'm not following what the Word of God is teaching me, but instead I'm going by how I feel, and so I just immediately start turning away from all of these physical, natural things that are telling me that I'm, God doesn't love me, that God's not with me or whatever. And I turn to the Word and I start reading. And I encourage myself and build myself up in the Lord. You know, there was an instance where I went to Pritchett, Colorado. I had moved from Childress, Texas. I was pastoring a church there and it wasn't big by, you know, most people's standards. There was only 50 or 60 people coming, but for the first time in my ministry, we had enough people coming that I was eating on a regular basis. It looked like we were going to live and not die. And I was uh, successful to a degree that it was encouraging. And I left that group in, in uh, Childress, Texas, and went to a group in Pritchett, Colorado that had 10 people in it, in a town of 144 people. And you know what? It just looked like the end of the world. It looked like there was no way to survive this, but I knew that that's what God told me to do. So anyway, I went there, and I started ministering there, and within a very short period of time, uh, basically the people ran me out. They didn't like a lot of the things that I was teaching. But because of all of that, because I went there, God began to start moving in my life, and I began to start experiencing... God's supernatural provision for me. It was miraculous. And I just started resting in what God had already done. In the natural, there was no reason to expect this except that God had told me to go. And I just went in obedience. And did you know that even though we were in a negative situation, the people criticized me, they basically ran me off. I didn't take a salary from the church or any of that. Did you know that I prospered more than I ever had before? God began to just start giving us things. We had, at that time, I forget the exact amount, but I think it was about $6,000 a month coming in. I didn't take any money from the church whatsoever. I never took up an offering. We just had a can at the back of the church that people put money in. But I'd get it home and open up my Bible and $100 bills would go to falling out. People gave me entire cows and pigs and there was always uh, milk and eggs and things like this. And you know what? God began to just supernaturally bless us. And it wasn't because of something I was doing. God led me there. That was His grace for me. And I went there and He just supernaturally sustained me. That's where we saw our very first person raised from the dead. And we, saw, we started seeing all kinds of miracles. And great things happened. And it just happened because... God, by grace, had already provided everything for us. He told me that this was where he wanted me to go. I went there, and God supernaturally met my need. But when I was there, these people started criticizing me. And long story, but I, got, I started having depression and discouragement and bitterness come at me because I had given up this church that we were actually succeeding in, and I left it to come to a place of 10 people. 
And those people may not have recognized it, but from my perspective, I gave up the first security that it looked like I ever had, and I gave up all of these things to come minister to them, and there wasn't a one of them that appreciated it. And so I was getting ready to have myself a pity party. And I was waiting on Jamie and my boys to go to bed, and then I was going to go down into the basement, and I was just going to gripe and complain, and I was anticipating it. I was looking forward to it. You know, sometimes when you're fighting discouragement, you just feel like it would be better if I just wallowed in pity, amen. And I'd sent out all my invitations, all of the demons in Baca County, Colorado that were showing up. They were ready for this pity party. And I was just waiting on everybody to go to bed, and I was sitting there, and I was at the kitchen table, and I remember just kind of flopping open the Bible, and it fell open to Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. And when I read that, I thought, you know what? My spirit is still rejoicing. I don't care what's going on in the flesh. I don't care what's happened in the natural. My spirit, man, is okay. And God began to start speaking to me about you got a choice. Are you going to indulge your flesh and give in to these feelings? Or are you going to go by who you are in the spirit and operate in what you've got in the spirit? And honestly, I was kind of looking forward to this pity party. But you know what? I got to thinking about it, and by the time Jamie and the boys were asleep, I was so built up and fired up, and I went down and I started praising God and thanking God. I didn't feel like it, but I did it because I knew that that's what I had in my spirit. See, that I already had it. And this revelation that I'm trying to share with you has revolutionized my life. I could have given in to that depression and discouragement. And you know what? We were in a bad situation at that time. I could have given in to it. And if I had, it probably would have been the end of my ministry. I probably would never have gone on radio. That's right at the time I, the Lord led me to go on radio. I would have never been on television. I would have stopped. I don't know if I'd still be alive. But if I would be alive, I guarantee I wouldn't be on television. I wouldn't be touching your life. Everything would have been totally different if I'd have given in to those emotions. But see, understanding what I'm trying to describe here about entering into the rest, I understood that God had already in my spirit given me love and joy and peace. And I don't care what I feel like, what things look like in the natural, I know that in the spirit it's complete. That there is a place of rest to where I don't get out of it and I get over here into griping and complaining. I just rest in the Lord. I know that he's a good God. Whatever people are doing to me or whatever's happening in the natural doesn't catch him by surprise. He's already given me the grace to be able to deal with it and handle it. And I've just learned. I'm learning. I'm not perfect. I hadn't arrived, but I've left. And I am learning to stay in that position of peace. And I just don't get out of it. I just don't get upset over things. I don't obsess over things. I am not going there because I understand this balance between grace and faith. And like I'm teaching specifically this week, I've learned how to enter into the rest of the Lord. Today, I'm out of time, but on next week's program, I'm going to continue this, and I've got a lot more to share about entering into the rest. And I think it'll be a blessing to you. So listen in next Monday, and also listen as our announcer gives you information about how you can write or call and receive these materials that I have on living in the balance of grace and faith. Andrew's complete teaching titled Living in the Balance of Grace and Faith is now available in a new paperback book for £9.99. Contact us today to get your copy. In addition, you can also get this teaching in a companion study guide for £17.50. This teaching was also recorded live at a Gospel Truth Seminar. It's available on either CD or DVD. Or if you prefer, you can get this DVD as seen on TV. Each is available for £16. Remember to specify CD, DVD, or DVD as seen on TV when you contact us. This series is also available for audio download absolutely free on our website. Go to awme.net and click on MP3 Downloads on the left-hand side of the page. The fourth audio teaching in today's series is available for three pounds when you write or call. But if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will send this fourth CD titled, Entering the Rest, Free of Charge. 
You can use your credit card to order resources by telephone. Our helpline number is 01922-473-300. When calling from outside the UK, you must dial your international calling code, then 44 1922 473 300. Helpline hours are from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. Or you can visit our website where you can order ministry materials 24 hours a day, 7 days a week at awme.net. To write us, use the address on your screen. We hope to hear from you today. We'd like to point out Andrew's upcoming speaking schedule. Mark your calendars to come meet Andrew at one of these events and let the Word of God transform your life. He'll be in Karlsruhe, Germany this week, October 21st through the 23rd, and in Warwick, England for the Andrew Womack Ministries of Europe Ministers Conference, October 24th through the 26th. He'll also be in Kampala, Uganda for a Gospel Truth Seminar, October 28th and 29th, and at the Glory of Christ Church in Kampala, Sunday, October 30th. For more details on Andrew's next meeting in your area, call our helpline or visit our website at awme.net. John chapter 14, verse 1. The very first thing that Jesus told his disciples, he says, let not your heart be troubled. When I looked into his face, I saw his eyes flittering. And so um, I yelled at him and I says, you are not going to leave me. Next thing I know, I'm down in the emergency room at the Stroke Center in Harris Methodist in Fort Worth. One third of Alan's brain had not received blood. The MRI scan of the brain showed a massive stroke. They told me he was paralyzed on the left side. They told me that he could not swallow. They told me he could not speak. They were saying he's going to need a stomach tube to be fed the rest of his life. We were not very optimistic about the outcome. We had spent that time in Christian survival. We had spent that time in harnessing your emotions. And I was harnessing my emotions. I was completely under control. And that's what disturbed um, the doctors the most. They were not going to speak death over him because his life was in the balance. And I knew the truth, and the truth was gonna set him free. And I knew it. I knew it would set complete, it would set everything free. Log on to awmi.net. Look to the left. Click on Healing Testimonies. And take a healing journey with Alan and Debbie Moore. Discover what's happening at Andrew Womack Ministries. Are you a world changer? Karis Bible College has extension schools around the world. The same truth that sets you free at our school in England will also set you free in Belfast, St. Petersburg, Amsterdam, Kampala, Chennai, and South Africa. Go to awme.net or call our phone center and ask for a complete list of Karis Bible College locations near you. Change your life. Change the world.